one of the ladies, a non-Muslim guest, she asked this question, okay, what are the differences? So I mentioned to her, Islam came to unite people and not to divide people. So I, yes, important, right? Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful, and welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. You know, first and foremost, we would like to thank the Creator for having us gather here together as brothers and sisters. Secondly, we want to give a big round of applause to all the volunteers who make this happen. Big, all the Muslims, alhamdulillah. You know, when I take a look at people of different faiths, nationalities, and backgrounds coming together, it reminds me of a really important event that uh, happened, three, or actually in the history of the USA. So here is my question to all of you. Then I will come back to this question, right? My question to all of you is this. When do you, th the very uh, first time in the USA, the interfaith iftar happened? A hint, it happened in the White House. Which president that you think brought people together for the very first fast-breaking iftar? Any takers without Googling the answer? Yes, brother. <gasps> yes, you got it. How did you know that? <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> So 1809 was the very first time. I am really glad that somebody knew the answer. Very good. So many of you, you may not be aware. Some of you, you may be aware, like Brother Christopher, who was sitting next to me. He asked me a question. OK, you know, Sabil, what is going on today, right? <laughs> so I mentioned to him that we are gathered here to, uh, to get, uh, today with our interfaith partners so we can educate each other and we can break bread together as brothers and sisters. But many of you, you may not know about Ramadan. All you may know is, yes, we Muslims fast. That we are hungry for about 16 hours a day. You may not know anything beyond that. So the very first thing, the very first reason that we fast is, God, Allah has given this to us as an obligation. He mentioned a special passage of the Quran, and that passage it says, chapter 2, verse number 183, that all you who believe, fasting has been given to you as it was given to those before you, that you may become God conscious. So that's the very first and the most important reason that why Muslims fast. And fasting is not only giving the food and the water, fasting is also fasting from any wrong things we are not supposed to be doing. Like backbiting and cheating and lying and disobeying people, you know, parents, cutting people off in the traffic, right? <laughs> Anything we're not supposed to be doing, we should be so conscious of avoiding them this month that they should be away from our life for the rest of our lives. And then we fast from dawn to sunset. This is not a 24-hour day fasting. We start our fasting at dawn, which is approximately, uh, what, 4.30 a.m. in the morning, and then we break the fast at sunset. 7.30? Yeah, approximately. You know, by this time, People know the exact time, all right? <laughs> when do we break the fast? <laughs> As our past president is saying, not only they're counting down the minutes, they're counting down the seconds <laughs> this time, right? 7.31 today. 7.31 to be exact, right? <laughs> so make sure the time is increasing <laughs> compared to yesterday. So what do we do? What is a typical day of fasting? I mean, obviously, we go, we wake up in the morning, approximately 4 a.m. in the morning. All right, just imagine waking up at 4 a.m., right? You're sleepy, you're tired, then we eat the first morning meal so we can be nourished for the rest of the day. And then for the rest of the day, we need to make sure that we are attentive of the obligations Allah God has given to us. Besides the praying, besides the fasting, we should be overly conscious about thanking the Creator, about connecting with the Quran, about being good to the neighbors. So we should be overly conscious for the rest of the day. At sunset, we do the fast breaking, which is going to happen uh, today, about approximately 7, uh, 7.31. And at the night time, we do the extra special prayers. So beyond the five prayers, there's a prayer called the Taravi prayer. So we do that. So if you stay here, 
9.30 is the Isha time? If you stay until 9.30, the whole mosque would be full, like a thousand people would be there, right? So they'll be praying the extra prayer, which is the extra night prayer. And this is the morning meal that we take, approximately 4 a.m. So according to the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we start the fast with the date fruit. And we break the fast also with the date fruit. So for me, if you ask me the question, is it easy to fast? Is it easy to give up water and food? I would say yes, compared to giving up all the wrong things we should not be doing. So they should, they should be away from our life for the rest of our lives. On the same token, it is also important for us to inculcate all the good things we should be doing. Respecting parents, taking care of the neighbors. You know, in this month when I went to MEC, our child care brothers and sisters, they had all the youth up there and they were making sanitary bags for the homeless ladies. It was so amazing. Give them a big round of applause. This was so amazing. Right? Alhamdulillah. So every mosque all over the USA, all over the world, they do something like this to help out the bigger community. And then as we move on, there are many, many special uh, spiritual benefits of fasting, obviously. Suppose if I mention to you there is a girl in Syria and she is hungry. You may feel some empathy for her, but if I show her image to you, you may feel extra empathy. Your empathy may increase if you place yourself in her shoes by also being hungry the way that she is hungry. So when we fast for about 30 days, 29 days, we can place ourselves in the shoes of those hundred, millions, not hundreds, millions and billions of people around the world. You know, right here in the USA, there are 50 million people who are below the poverty line. Not enough to eat. So when we are fasting, we can actually feel how they are feeling. So that is supposed to help out, uh, help us to reach out to people, to have empathy, to open our hearts and minds, our wallets, so we can help out our fellow Americans. So after the 29, 30 days of fasting, there is a celebration, right? There's a day of celebration, one of the two days of celebrations. So this is called as the Eid, which is celebration. In the morning, we do the morning prayer, we take the shower, then we go to the mosque, and uh, then we come home, our parents, our spouses, they have this extra special, uh, you know, delicious meals. And then we also go out and we help the poor and the needy people in the society. All things considered, I would say that fasting the month of Ramadan is a spiritual boot camp for us. After the 29 to 30 days, a Muslim is supposed to transform themselves to such a degree. Now they should be better family members, better neighbors, better spouses and better children, better humans, and better worshippers of the Creator. So on behalf of the mosque, on behalf of the Muslim community, I want to thank all of you for coming over here. May God help us with his guidance so we can live as brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. So any question that you may have about Ramadan, about Islam, about the Muslim community center, now is the time for you. We have approximately maybe 10 or so minutes. So I will open the floor. The mic is yours, go ahead. Okay, here is the question. Okay, here is the question. What do you think uh, is common between the Muslims fasting, the Ramadan, and uh, Prophet Jesus and Prophet Moses? Okay, here is a, that is a question for those uh, of the non-Muslim faith uh, friends who are here. Go ahead, take a shot, anyone. Okay, what is the connection between the Ramadan fasting and uh, then Prophet Moses and Prophet Jesus? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, he fasted in the desert for 40 days or 30 days. And Moses was on the mountain alone, I guess eating, I'm not sure, 30 or 40 days also. All right, very good, she got it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Wonderful. You know, that, that passage of the Quran with our uh, Sheikh when he recited, mashallah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, the translation is this. That fasting has been given to you as it was given to those before you, that you may uh, gain God consciousness. So the second part of the passage is that fasting was also prescribed to those people and the prophets and their groups before us. And the evidence, as you mentioned, was also from the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. 
that Moses, peace be upon him, who we take to be as a mighty prophet, he was in the state of fasting when he received the Ten Commandments, according to the Bible. So this is in the book of Exodus chapter 34, verse number 28. And Jesus, peace be upon him, who we consider as a mighty prophet, he also fasted for about 40 days, according to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, verse number 2. So when people, when they ask me, why are you fasting? I say to them, I'm fasting because God, Allah has commanded me and the Muslims to fast. I'm also fasting because I'm following the footsteps or the sunnah of all the prophets of God, including Prophet Moses and Prophet Jesus. So I'm glad that mashallah, our sister in the back, she knew the answer, right? Very good. Um, well, I'm a convert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, mashallah, all right. All right, welcome, welcome to Islam, mashallah. We have many services for you, alhamdulillah. All right, go ahead, we have more questions. We still have time, right? 7.32. Last time I thought it was 7.31. <laughs> it increased by, what is going on by the Nasir? It's moving up. It's moving up. Don't tell me 7.33 now, okay? You will No, don't. <laughs> yes. Why don't you tell us some commonalities between the three major uh, faith that is followed in America? All right, that's an important question. You know, many a times when I meet uh, our people of other faiths, it was Majid al Rahma about three days ago. Ten minutes? No, but one second, I want to say something else. Oh. So about uh, last week, there was a Masjid open house in Majid al Rahma back in Lake Villa, all the way up there, close to Wisconsin. One of the ladies, a non-Muslim guest, she asked this question, okay, what are the differences? So I mentioned to her, Islam came to unite people and not to divide people. So I, yes, important, right? So I started off with mentioning the commonalities to her. So what comes to my mind, Sister Sabah and all of us would be, first and foremost, all of us, we believe in a higher power. So that is a good place for us to start from. So we believe in a higher power. We may have different names for the same creator. Muslims in the Quran, we say God, his name is Allah in Arabic language. But in the Hebrew language, uh, it is uh, Jehovah, uh, Elohim, right? In the language of Jesus, peace be upon him, what was his language? Aramaic, Aramaic language. In his language, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, it is Ilah or Allah. So that's the very first commonality, is that we believe in a higher power. The second commonality is, we believe in prophethood. So here is a quick quiz question to all of you, based upon that, uh, that, uh, that point. Which prophet do you think is the most mentioned prophet in the whole Quran by name? Now you cannot answer, okay? <laughs> by name, no, not, <laughs> oh, you're going to say that, okay, I got you. So which prophet is the most mentioned prophet by name in the whole Quran? And a hint would be for our guest, he's the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. So this question is only for the guests who are here, okay? The ladies up there and, uh, okay, fine, you can take a shot. <laughs> yeah, Prophet Moses, yes. Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. So that's the second commonality is that almost all the prophets of the Old Testament, we also Muslims have to believe in them to be a Muslim. Look at it, right? Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's mentioned by five times by name in the Quran. Moses, peace be upon him, 136 times in the Quran. Almost every chapter, every page, there is, there we go, the Prophet Moses is there. The third commonality would be, is we believe in the concept of divine revelation. So one of the six articles of faith is to believe in the revelations that came to Prophet Abraham and Moses and David and yes, Jesus, peace be upon them. And the last revelation, obviously, would be the Quran. Fourth, fifth commonality, right? <laughs> fifth commonality would be, we believe in the concept uh, of uh, doing good, the commandments. You know, the Bible has 613 commandments. Quran has many more, more comprehensive way and more detailed way. The next commonality would be, I would say the concept of the hereafter, accountability that one day we have to face the Creator and He's going to take us into account how did you live this life. So according to Islam, a person having the right belief and doing good deeds, that would be the criteria to go to paradise. And I hope and pray that all of us, 
we are together in paradise by God's guidance as brothers and sisters. So th those would be the six commonalities that came to my mind, Sister Sama. So just a footnote, uh, one other commonality between uh, Islam and uh, the New Testament or the Christian uh, faith is we believe in Mary. You know, in fact, Mary is the only person, only lady mentioned by name in the whole Quran. About 34 times, right? About 34 times. In, there is a passage in the Quran, chapter 3, verse number 42 to be exact. God sent an angel to Mary and this angel is saying to Mary that, Oh Mary, God has chosen you. God has purified you and God has chosen you above all the ladies. See, that honor is not given by that name in that way to the mother, the wife or the daughter of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. A Jewish lady, quote unquote, who came before 600 years before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was given that distinction. So see, if uh, the Quran was coming from the mind of Muhammad, peace be upon him, he would have praised his mother, his wife, his daughter. But he's praising someone who came 600 years before him. So that also is really important for us to bind us together and to build that connection between the faiths.